What's going on, world? It is June 25th, the day after Bellator NYC. The card in in Madison Square Garden, Bellator's first major pay-per-view, I think, outside of the one shot they tried way back when. So this is Bellator's big crowning moment as far as MMA goes, as far as broadcast goes, as far as everything. They signed Mike Goldberg to a deal. They signed Mauro Ronaldo to a commentating deal. Brendan Schaub was working the desk panel, you know, the the mock, you know, Fox desk panel, you know, so they had a I had all hands on deck for this event. Um, and I, like I said, I'm, I'm not a strong proponent for Bellator. I, I do not speak highly of Bellator. And I, I watch MMA like this is what I watch. This is what I do. It's my only sport. I watch Lex Legacy FC. I got my DVR set to record every regional promotion I can. I've been to several fights in person with teammates and and cornering coaches and cornering friends. Um, so MMA is my sport. Bellator has never done it for me. And this this card this is not this card is not going to be the one to change the tone or change the context of my uh, conversation. Um, this card was laughable and uh, it had points at points. It was sheer and utter comedy. But I'm seeing it being praised. Uh, I'm seeing the broadcast elements being uh, represented well online. I'm seeing people. Um, very excited and and uh, kind of reminiscent of the the Wild West of MMA. You know the kind of anything could happen. Uh, this is not any set in stone thing. Okay, so um, my point with that, my my conversation point, my dialogue point with that sort of notion is it ain't two thousand nine. It ain't fucking Strike Force. It ain't UFC on Spike. This is twenty seventeen. And if that's the standard we're holding a good card to, man. We need to reevaluate and reassess with our dialogue about this sport, because um, if our dialogue is that this sport and an event was reminiscent of an old event and that is a qualification for it to be a good event, man, we got to change the context. Um, let's go through some of the fights on the card, some of the moments that were more. Um, let's just go through the fights. We'll, we'll, we'll address them as we get to them. Or let's, let's start from the top. Go down. Chelsea Sutton versus Vanderlei Silva is the main event. You know, so they're trying to ride off the wave of uh, can't let you get close. You know, Chelsea and Vanderlei's little uh, little scuffle, uh, a little scuffle on the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, you know, Chelsea is corny as shit. Uh, they call him one of the greatest self promoters in MMA. He's corny as shit. Like, let's be real, he's corny. He's good on the podcast. He's very smart. He's very analytical. He's very uh, he's very focused and he's very driven as far as his his lines of communication, the way he the way he uh, displays himself to the world. He's very open. And um, very honest person, but when it comes to promoting fights and selling fights, it's just like straight out of left field Looney Tune shit. Always has been, you know. That's the that's the charm of the show. That's what people like. It's always out of left field. Like I've been calling Anderson Silva out for eight years now. Eight years, motherfucker. Wouldn't you getting submitted on the prelims? Eight. Oh, okay, okay. I digress. But anyway, him versus Chelsea Sonnen. Chelsea Sonnen versus Vanderlei Silva is the main event. Um, Three round fight because Bellator still believes in three round main events. Come on now, come on now. It's 2017. Like I said, if we're holding them at this standard, if we're gonna act like this is a comparable event to any event that the UFC houses, a UFC on Fox card. Come on, let, let, let's let's be real. A three round main event between Vanderlei Silva, a Pride legend, a UFC veteran, a, a former champion in Pride, a, you know, tournament winner, you know, that type of. Those type of accolades, but he's fighting in a three round main event at Bellator 2017. Come on now, let's get our shit together. Fight, not good, not good, not a good fight, not by any any facet. Not a good fight. The best thing in that fight was how aggressive Chell's first power double leg was. It looked like some shit out of GSP's old fights, like Vanderlei went flying. Uh, Chell got hit with some like punch over the top and stumbled you know so there was drama in the fight but not a good fight it's not a good competitive fight with nuance it's just drama because they're two old dated bad fighters like neither one of them are great right now like let's not be let's not let's be let's be real neither one of them are at the top of their game so what you see from them is just what they can do and what they're capable of at this stage in their career. Chell Sonnen never was that great, so he was always really good at controlling and getting power doubles, but always kind of cracked under pressure. 
he didn't crack tonight. So I guess that's a that's a win in his book, because when he did get cracked and when he fell over and he could have easily just looked for a way out, he didn't. He got the takedown, got control, started looking for arm locks. He was even trying to finish the fight with arm locks at the end of the fight. So Chell Sonnen held up, which is a fucking shocker because it's not common. It's not uh, a guy with 15 losses and like nine of them are by triangle choke. It's not it's not um, it's not what you expect to see out of him, but not a good fight. Let's not be let's not pretend that it was uh, they, they reshowed the uh, Newman Gracie fight. Great win for him. Good to see a Gracie on top finishing with submissions. That's kind of what you want to see out of the Gracies. Uh, but once again, like this is not like top level MMA. This was very, very down homey, very could have been at a regional show MMA. Like, let's be real quality wise. Then you go to the co-main of the, the second main event, not the co-main event, but the second main event, which is Matt Mitrion versus Fedor Himelianenko. Stopped at one minute and 14 seconds by punches. There was a fucking double knockdown in this fight. People were like, oh, it's such a rare thing. It's a rare thing because it doesn't happen at the highest levels. That's why it's rare. You see this shit on regional shows, two guys knocking each other down and knocking each other out. In this case, you see the the greatest of all time heavyweight, the person that's most praised as the greatest of all time heavyweight versus Matt Mitrione, who's, you know, he's had his he's had his fair shake. Uh, you know, he's done some good things in MMA. He's fought some of the better fighters. He's beat some of the better fighters. He's done some good things, but mm, mm, not the upper echelon, right? Uh, double knockdown. Then Match Michion gets up in true Dragon Ball tournament fashion. Who gets up first wins the fight? He gets up, rolls over to Fedor. Fedor kind of rolls under, takes a couple shots, starts wrestling the referee, and, you know, they call that shit off. Fedor Emelianenko not buying what he's selling. He should not be fighting in 2017. As old as he is, as many punches as he's taken, you get knocked down by a double knockdown, and then you get stopped by the very next punch that hits you. It's just like, nah, man, I don't... It's not the kind of fights I want to watch. <laughs> not the kind of not the kind of knockouts I want to see. You know, the the greatest of all times. Like if he would have, he didn't go out on a good note in his la- in his career, and, and it's a shame. Um, it's a shame we never got to see him against the greats when he was great. So it's kind of like one of them things. Let's go down to the next fight, man. Let's go down to the third main event. Uh, you know, because it was all main events. You know, because it was a championship fight. Then it was that terrible Fedor Mitrione double knockdown scenario. Nightmare fodder, like the funniest shit I ever seen. Like that was the Three Stooges moment of the night. Like that had to be the funniest shit I ever seen. I, I I couldn't script that thing. Like you couldn't script that fight better. That fight was the most cartoony, Looney Tune Tom and Jerry, Rock'em Sock'em. You know they they both land straight straight rights, I guess, because they're both right handed. Uh, they both land straight right. Both fall down. Um, one a little bit hits the ground a little bit harder. Matt Mitrione was a little bit more spry. You know he is younger. Just cartoony shit. Just <sighs> cartoony shit. Okay, so we go down to Brett Primus versus Michael Chandler. Michael Chandler comes out. You know, Michael Chandler's Bellator's guy. Like he's he's the guy they're trying to push the hardest, right? He's the guy with the he's got the he's got the momentum. He's in the Dave and Buster's commotion, commercials and shit. He's the guy that they're trying to push. He's he's probably the best talent in the sport in the sport for them. Well, debatable, but he is the guy that that Bellator should be pushing and trying to push, and they do. Uh, he comes out, you know. In form versus Brett Primus, a guy who is virtually unknown, but give him, stern enough to give him a test, right? Comes out, blocks a head kick, steps back, rolls his ankle. You know, I've rolled my ankle several times. I played basketball. I've rolled my ankles in the gym training in May. I broke my toes rolling my ankles. Like, let's, it's, it's, it's shit. It sucks like a motherfucker. And you can't tell where your feet are anymore. Like, you can't tell if your foot's on the ground. You can't tell. You just don't know. Until the round's over, you just don't know. Uh, every time you lift your foot, you kind of um, you have to be aware that, that your foot might not actually be lifting. You might just feel like it is like it's numb. You don't know. So uh, he stumbles on his foot a lot after that. Like he rolls his ankle and stumbles on his foot. Looks like a noodle underneath him. Just kind of weebly wobbly, you know, tip top teeter totter. And he couldn't keep his shit together. And he was stumbling. Smacks Brett Primus with an overhand. Damn near finishes the motherfucker. Goes to the corner. Uh, you know, goes to the corner. They start measuring his ankle. Cool. They let him stand back up. So it was like the fight was about to go on, right? No one stopped the fight. They didn't wave it off while he was on the stool. None of that. He's up on his feet, raving to the crowd, trying to get you know get the attention back, get the excitement back. He goes to sit down, but the commission member pulled the stool. He he pulled the stool. He goes to sit, falls. I guess they heard the fall because they just stopped the fight instantly. They were, I guess they just heard the fall and assumed he still couldn't stand up. Stopped the fight. This is some shit you couldn't script, like. 
from the angle that is shown on TV, it looked like that was the cause of the stoppage. It might not have been like they might have already made the decision coherently. But when he fell again, they and didn't look back to see what was the situation that he fell from. I think that that made a play, played a factor, might have played a huge factor and from the broadcast, from what you saw at home. It looked exactly like that was what caused it, because as soon as he fell, the ref was like, no, nah, no. Nah. Commission was like, nope, nope. This motherfucker can't stand. He done fell again. He didn't fall. Commission member pulled a stool and he sat down and fucking sat on his ass. This is some cartoon shit like this. <sighs> okay, so we moved down to Zach Freeman versus Aaron Pico. Aaron Pico is the prospect they were talking about. Man, all the promotion was behind him. 20 years old, uh, Olympic level wrestler, golden gloves, you know, been boxing since he was 10. All that, you know, all that stuff, you know, all that promotion. Like they put all that energy behind him. I think Bellator signed him like three years ago. This is his first fight on pay per view. First fight against Zach Freeman, who just fought for the RFA title, lost the decision in a five round fight that he had a broken hand in. You know, just you know, just a little bit, a little bit of backside. Uh, so <laughs> eight and two, you know, for Zach Freeman. Aaron Pico, zero and zero, no fights, no MMA fights anyway. I don't know what his amateur boxing record looked like. Don't know. Twenty years old, comes out like a house on fire, gets rocked and dropped by an uppercut. First fight, chin cracked already. First fight, chin checked. Hits the deck from an uppercut. <laughs> you couldn't script this shit. Like you couldn't, you couldn't write a more cartoonish way to fail. He's pop with an uppercut. Hits the deck. Gets slapped on a guillotine. Rolled to a five finger guillotine. Choked out. Choked unconscious. Seized up in the ring. Amateur. I mean, you know, no amateur fights. First pro fight. The prospect you're trying to sell gets whacked. Uppercut. You know, the boxer. Gets popped by an uppercut at range, hits the deck, chin checked already. Like they say, once your chin gets cracked, man, it's kind of one of them things, a slippery slope. But he's 20, so he, you know, everybody's like, okay. They went to the panel. They show, you know, they show people who get knocked out a lot. You know, they showed, uh, they showed Brendan Shop talking about knockouts and, and all that shit. Like, how, you know, get his perspective on the situation. He's like, this is not gonna, this is not gonna hurt Aaron Pico, bro. You get your chin checked in your first fight. You a sucker for the uppercut in your first fight? Damn. If your next opponent don't pop you with an uppercut, he is a fool. He is a failure. But I digress, man. All the money they put behind this dude, it didn't pay off the way they planned. And and, and, and that's the thing that they were like, oh, the, pred the predictability of MMA, the predictability. If he was a better fighter, if he was more skilled, more talented, more ready, more experienced, more seasoned, there wouldn't be this unpredictable element. Like, the unpredictable element, like... How many fights in the UFC have you seen in, in 2016, 2017 that something unpredictable happened? Like something something out of pocket happened. Something you wasn't expecting. You know, come on now. Let's, let's be real. In the low-level fights, yeah, you, you might catch some shit that you weren't expecting. Uh, I wasn't expecting Kevin Kevin Lee to hit fucking uh, Tornado with a head kick. It's in his background, but I've never seen him do it. But when he did it, it like shocked. It shook up, it shook up the way you viewed him. You know, you're like, oh, shit, Kevin Lee is not just a, a wrestler who can technically kind of box. He also got the kicking game going. And look at him. He kicked a kickboxer in the head, stunned him, and finished him. That's what you see at the highest levels. You see growth. You don't see fluke victories. You don't see people getting popped by uppercuts in their first fight, hit the deck, and get choked unconscious. That's, damn. Who had a better, somebody put up a whole meme. Like, it, it was up, and it was up instantly. Who had a better debut? CM Punk or Aaron Pico? Shit. At this rate, CM Punk. He ain't get his jaw jacked. He ain't get Jack knocked down and fucking almost KO'd. Freeman could have backed off of Pico and KO'd him on the mat. Why he didn't, I don't know. I, I'll never know why MMA fighters, uh, I guess because more guys who train submissions more specifically look to submit people, but I'll never understand why guys who knock their opponent completely senseless don't allow them to stand back up and wreck them again. I come from a striking background, mostly boxing my, all my MMA was mostly boxing, little tie boxing with some of my coaches that also fought in glory, uh, some fighting legacy still currently mostly boxing, though. I did mostly boxing. So my perspective is I pop you, I drop you, you get up, I drop you again. So my perspective is different. My training background warrants my perspective being different. Let's jump down to the card a little bit. We go down to Lorenz Larkin, who just. Bulldoze Neil Magny, fucking six foot three and at welterweight with a long ass fucking reach. He runs through him, runs through him. What happens when he comes over to Bellator and fights a striker of similar skill, uh, a similar style too? 
He does what Lorenz Larkin does all the time when he fights a striker who's just as good or slightly better. Nothing. That's what he does. He fought fucking, what's his name, uh, Albert Truman off. It was a leg kick fest. He did more in that fight than he did in this fight. He at least attacked with something consistently. This fight, I would not tell anyone to go watch this fight. The best moment in this fight happened at the end of the second round. Lorenz Larkin looked like he caught Douglas Lima, kind of ran at him like he was going to stop him, and gets hit with just like a fucking check hook and flops to his butt, grabbing the fence for dear life. Holding the fence as he falls for dear life, like flop to his butt like a cartoon character. I'm going to say that phrase a lot because this shit reminds me of Tom and Jerry. Like the shit that I saw last night did not did not scream sport. It screamed cartoon. It screamed this is for shits and giggles like this. It it, it, it what they weren't playing for keeps out there. Let me tell you, they wouldn't they wouldn't baby eye drops them with the marbles. They weren't playing for keeps like this. This shit wasn't um, the fights did not deliver. It, it, Regardless of what anybody says, regardless of what you take away from this or what you take away from anything that any person in the media or any person says about this MMA f- event, the fights did not deliver. Let's not pretend that they did. The double knockdown in the Fedor fight was exciting because it was fucking hilarious. That's the only reason it was exciting. It was fucking hilarious. Let's be let's be frank. So anyway, Lorenzo Larkin, Douglas Lima. After that knockdown, five round fight. Nothing happens. Could have been a split decision, but they unanimous decision towards Douglas Lima because he landed the more effective strikes, more effective strikes. <laughs> I'm always going to argue with that term, more effective strikes, because in MMA, that's a thing. More effective. How you? How is it more effective? It looks more effective. Is it visually more appealing? Um, because in the context of striking, if you're not the one being hit, you don't know how effective a strike was. You can hit me with a jab all day, but if you got a soft jab... Are you being truly effective? I guess if your jab stopped me from landing the overhand, um, then I guess you're being more effective. Your your jab is effectively slowing down me doing anything back. But that was like that's a term they use in MMA. They always oh the shots look harder. They looked more impactful. Looked more impactful. Were they more impactful? You don't know this thing. This is intangible. This is intangible. Uh, the jab Nate Diaz was using Conor McGregor's body in the first fight didn't look more effective. It looked weak. It looked soft compared to the overhands Nate was taking for that. But in the third round, when Connor told, slowed down from them jabs to the gut, was it more effective? Clearly, right. Small jab, punch you weren't thinking about, not the overhand you saw. So if that fight went to the card and Connor never slowed down, Connor wins by decision because he landed the more effective strikes. But in reality, the jabs to the body is what slowed him down and not just physically stopped his mo- momentum. It tired him the, those jabs to the body those small strikes that didn't look effective effectively tired him so that that whole word effective is always uh, I'm always gonna be it's part of, it's a point of contention I used to have this argument with people I worked with all the time about what was effective in striking I used to, oh the punches looked harder they looked harder like the Robbie Lawler Carlos kind of situation it looked like he hit him with harder shots so he should get the nod he hit him with less shots you don't know if they're harder. Effective striking is, in my mind, the perfect example of effective striking is Connor versus Eddie Alvarez. Even if those shots didn't drop him, he was slipping and landing. That's effectiveness. He's hitting and not being hit. Uh, uh, let's, let's go DJ Wilson Hayes. Even though those shots were crippling Wilson Hayes, if they weren't, even if that fight, Wilson Hayes never got rocked, never got fucking bludgeoned and bloodied dj was hitting and not being hit that's effectiveness he wasn't getting countered every time he landed something he wasn't trading every time he landed something that's effectiveness but the power like it's it's hard to it's hard for me to justify power something unmeasurable something you don't know because it's a personal one-to-one thing it's i hit you you got hurt not I hit you. People saw you get hurt. You got hurt. It's it's connected one to one. When I hit you, you get hurt. You will show signs of being hurt. Then people can acknowledge that I hurt you. That's the only way to measure power in terms of strikes and when strikes land. I could hit you with something that hurt you severely, but no one noticed because it was a small, not pretty, not something you not something clear straight to the straight line, straight divine punch. Like I can hit you with a, a jab that 
you seem virtually unfazed from, but could be rocked to your core. You could poker face it. Your jaw could be broken. That's effective. That's power. That's being hurt. But, you know, in MMA, if your head pops back or you take a slight stutter step after a strike, it was clearly more effective because it clearly visually looked more powerful. I digress. That point, I can beat you to death at that point. I can talk about that shit all fucking day. Let's move down the card. Douglas Lima, Lorenz Larkin, not good. Not good. Then you go down to what exactly I predicted, what was going to happen entirely the way I said it was going to happen. Phil Davis versus Ryan Bader is the same fight, just two rounds longer. I said it. I said it all week. I said it when I found out they booked it. It's going to be the same fight, two rounds longer. That's it. Nothing changed. It was the same boring fight by two two guys who just can't fight each other. And in this case, Phil Davis actually digressed in skill between the last time he fought Ryan Bader and Ryan Bader progressed. First fight, neither one were able to get each other down. This fight, Bader got him down a couple times, won the split decision and took his belt in a split decision. Took his belt. Phil Davis came to Bellator, made a name for himself. Excuse me while I move my microphone. You feel me? My neck is a little pinched leaning forward. But Phil Davis comes to Bellator, makes a name for himself, right? Gets a couple knockouts, you know? Stuns a middleweight, Francis Carmount. Actually, a fucking welterweight. But what if? Stuns him, knocks him out. Uh, gives Emmanuel Newton the run around. Gives Liam McGreary the run around. Then, you know, a UFC dropout, Ryan Bader. Last win was against Ilir Latifi. Before that, um, I think he was on like a four fight winning streak. He was actually doing all right, but he was moving up the ranks. He didn't want to get to the upper echelon. He got smoked by Rumble, who clearly can't win a title. Um, it's not a good look. You're not at the top of the, you're not at the top of the world when you uh, you can't beat the best and you you beat up on the lesser and you progress to a different league. And now call that league the better division because Phil Davis definitely said that he he said that that the light heavyweight division in Bellator was better than the UFC's. Well, obviously not because Ryan Bader just came here and took a title from you with a split decision, and he couldn't even stay in the fight with Rumble Johnson for more than a minute, and he shot for a takedown and wrestled. You know, he didn't get stunned on the feet against Rumble. He wrestled, got flattened and hammered to death by a lesser known wrestler, someone who. You know, is lesser known for his wrestling. That's the point I'm trying to make. That you two highly esteemed wrestlers couldn't get each other down, barely. Could couldn't grapple, couldn't get anything accomplished. But the last guy to flatten Ryan Bader flattened him with the wrestling. So do with that what you will. Uh, not a good fight. Not a good fight. Not at all. Uh, uh, you, you could have seen this fight a thousand times on uh, the beginning of a UFC fight past prelims. You know, like this. Not a good fight. Neither guy willing to engage. Neither guy willing to take risk. Brian Bader was a little bit more so willing to take risk. He shot for takedowns, but he got him. You know, the acceptable risk. Uh, you know, so it is what it is. Not a good fight. Okay, so I'm not going to do this entire card. I'm going to stop after these next two fights because the rest, frankly, I didn't see. Didn't feel motivated enough to watch. Uh, you know, no knock to Hugh McKinney victory over John Salago. Like I said, don't know. Submitted him with an arm bar in the first round. Or Kimura in the first round. Keylock. Don't know these guys. Like, um, you know, no comment, right? Like, so let's go to the fights that I want to actually highlight. It's not all bad, you know. It's not all bad. Sometimes the, the fighters deliver. Whereas the broadcast and you know, card didn't. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about what did happen. James Gallagher, 20 years old, young, hungry, like he said, trying to be the greatest fighter ever. You know, James Gallagher fights Chinzo Machida, the older brother of Leona Machida, featherweight, I think. Um, Chinzo Machida should be an elusive striker. James Gallagher comes out like a house on fire, just like Conor McGregor, right in his face. Limiting the space, cutting off the octagon, landing shots. Before you know it, he's on Chinzo's back, choking him unconscious. Hell of a performance from James Gallagher. Hell of a prospect. While y'all are pitching all this money at Aaron Pico, y'all might want to start shelling that shit back towards Gallagher. That fight should have been on the main card. I don't know what the fuck y'all were thinking. 
<laughs> I don't know what the fuck y'all were thinking. That Aaron Pico, Zach Freeman shit. That should have been the fucking Spike, uh, the the Spike TV, you know, main event or whatever. You know that that Phil Davis, Ryan Bader shit. That could have been on the main card. You know, they could have slummed it up on the main card. I mean, honestly, it's a disrespect to Ryan Bader and Phil Davis to have them on the Spike when you got Aaron Pico getting smelt by Le- Zach Freeman on the main event. Like that, just you had an opportunity to have all your title fights and then your two main events on the same card, but you chose the path you did. Whatever. Gallagher Machida should have been the main event on Spike, but it was the co-main on Spike, you know, whatever. Gallagher did what he was supposed to do. He went out there, limited the space, and took him down and strangled him. That's what he was supposed to do. Amazing talent. Amazing talent. I I only can say good things about the kid at this point in his career. He has shown very little chips or chinks in his armor, and he's young. Any chink you see right now, he's not out there getting smoked and getting uppercut into oblivion and choked out like Aaron Pico. Not the same. But Aaron Pico, to his credit, consummate professional, did not shy away from what happened. He went to the press conference. He did the media. That kid, in spirit, he's going places. He has the right mentality to take loss. He understands loss. He responds to loss with professionalism. And that's that's a lot more than a lot of people can say about a lot of fighters. A lot of fighters would have just went home and hid and only been seen by Pavarazzi's. I digress. James Gallagher, hello performance. Shining moment for me as far as this card goes with that James Gallagher performance. Went in there and shut him out. Shinzo Machida's been winning in Bellator. He's been knocking people out. Even in the fight that he was getting, uh, he was getting touched pretty handily. Came back, got the finish in an exciting fashion. Like he's been dropping people, you know. So very risky fight for Gallagher. Did not look like it. Not at all. Shut him down. The next fight I want to highlight, next fighter I want to highlight, rather, is Heather the Heat Hardy. Two-division PBC champion currently. Boxer, puncher, slugger, trader, whatever you want to call it, brawler, whatever you, however you want to look at it. She came out there against Alice Yeager. Alice Yeager was tough, hanging in there. Not the same quality of boxer, but, you know, Heather Hardy out there getting tired. You know, MMA is different. Like, MMA is different. People say boxing is different. It's harder. MMA is different. When, when kicks are involved and, and takedowns are involved and the, the size of the just the massive size of the, the ring or the octagon you're in, it's different. It changes the context. You get tired faster. The things you think will work won't work. You know, it's just it just changes the context. And I'm going to further illustrate that point a little bit later based on what Heather Hardy said at the press conference. I'm going to talk a little bit more to the details she mentioned, but I'm going to talk about what I saw from her that I liked. Heather Hardy is, in my opinion, the first boxer to come into MMA that I've seen that was a pure pro boxer, championship level pro boxer. And then there's a lot in the UFC. There's a lot in MMA. There's a lot in general. Jessica Ricosi was a championship boxer. Holly Holmes, a championship boxer. All those women came across and did not do for me what Heather Hardy did in her first fight coming across. Uh, Kobe Northcutt debuted on the LFA card. Not great. High level karate fighter, tons of accolade, not a great performance, did not do anything to intimidate or hurt or do anything to her opponent and then got beat up on the ground and finished TKO. That's what you most commonly see when other sports athletes come across the MMA. You see them come across, not be able to get their game working, get shut down, get grappled and get finished. That's what you see. That's what you see. But Heather Hardy came across and did exactly what I've always wanted to see a boxer do in MMA. I've always wanted to see a puncher boxer, a boxer that is is in tight, fighting at range, slipping and ripping, landing shots, blocking in tight, landing combinations. That's what you expect to see when you hear pro boxer. But what you usually get is Jessica Ricosi looking to shoot for takedowns, getting submitted, um, not real aware of her footing, getting yanked up by single legs left and right. Or you get Holly Holm, real fleet footed outfighter, basically will lull you to a decision if she can. That's what you usually get. So it doesn't send a good message that boxers come into MMA well. It sends the message that it's a hard conversion. And it's a hard conversion, but it's a different conversion. It's just different. And what I expect to see out of boxers, I expect them to get in range. I expect them to slip shots from punching range from where we should be punching. 
that's the thing about MMA in context of MMA striking. The range is wider because of the kicks. The range is wider because of the takedowns It's wider because of the clinch. Everything is stepped back a foot. Whereas in boxing, people almost fight with their foot, their feet touching their, their toes are almost making contact. That's where boxers fight. And that's where they do their work. That's why it's a sweet science. That's why they slip come underneath the straight with an uppercut you know they they slip to the outside of the jab with an overhand and rip to the body and then come back around with the uppercut on the other side that's why they can fight and do those things from those positions and from those angles that's why the lead hook in boxing is so much shorter than it is in mma the lead hook in mma is almost a fucking jab it's so long because you have to throw it from so far away because you're starting from a foot out the lead hook in MMA is not a tight punch with a, a, a dynamic hooking ability. It's, it's mostly a feeler, a slap to get in the range and then to set up the straight, straight down the pipe or, or the overhand or whatever it is you fancy on the rear side. But in boxing, you're, you're in closer. When you slip the straight, you can actually slip the straight and land the forward to the body, which is the rear hook to the body. It depends on what boxing coach you started with. Uh, you, from boxing range, you you catch a guy going low for a jab to the body. You can hit him with a check hook. MMA, you can't land the check hook like you want to because the range is different. That's why when somebody has a dynamite lead hook, it's a big deal in MMA. Look at uh, look at what's his name, Bobby Knuckles, Robert Whitaker. His lead hook is dynamite. He can he can paw that jab at you. Get in the boxing range sleekly without you noticing and then jump in with a short hook and drop you. Look at the the Brad Tavares fight. Brad Tavares is trying to crash the space. Robert Whitaker closes that distance and hits him with a short hook, drops him. He gets back up, hits him with another short hook, finishes him. It's different. The context is different because the way fighters fight in MMA is a foot away from where they fight in boxing. And Heather Hardy came in got in range against alex yeager who is virtually unknown you don't know what she has endured you don't know what she's capable of gets in her face and boxes her slips rips rolls shots block shots in tight land combos off the block shots hands down by her side slipping punches that's not what you see when an mma fighter comes into boxing i mean a boxing fighter comes in mma that's not what you see you usually see them coming in trying not to get hit, trying to understand the range that MMA fighters fight from, trying to get good in that I'm going to stay away from you space. She came in, crashed the boards and landed shots and eventually dropped her with a straight, dropped her so hard. Alex Jaeger tried to step on on air to get back up to her feet and then didn't know she got knocked down, tried to shake Heather Hardy's hand because I guess she thought she slipped. She tried to dap her up like, oh, shit, I slipped. My bad. She tried to dap her up. Bitch, you were gone. Like, you were gone. After that straight point, straight punch, there was no Alex Jaeger to be found. Straight landed in third round after a headbutt that cut Heather Hardy. Seven stitches, blood trickling down her face. Hits her with a straight, drops her. Alex Jaeger gets up, doesn't know where she is, tries to touch gloves. Heather Hardy if looked, at her, looked her straight in her face like, nope, she's gone. Whacked her, comboed her against the fence, crippling shots. F- fight stopped. That's what you want to see when you see a boxer come over. I am never that excited when i hear boxer coming to mma but i've been excited since i heard heather hardy was coming in mma because i knew she was a puncher in boxer in boxing i knew she was a a, a in tight fighter landing shots ripping combos landing punches she might not be stopping all her opponents in boxing but she's undefeated and that's how she fights she's in your face she's landing shots she's slipping she's ripping she's boxing you and her boxing in mma was exactly what i was looking for just what the doctor ordered hell of a performance Glad it went three rounds. She got a taste for all three. It wasn't like she came out there, landed some shots, dropped her, and went home. Came out there, fought. Fought somebody who was willing who was willing to stay in there. Didn't give. Didn't break. And she didn't give her a reason to shut down. She just eventually led her into some punches. <laughs> like, that's the difference. MMA, sometimes you, you, you rely on fighters to get caught. You know, like something happened. They, they don't feel the range right. And boom, they get caught, cracked, dropped. Sometimes in boxing... They want you to trade with them. They want you to feel that you're with them. And then then just boom, out of nowhere. Now you're not. It's kind of how it works in boxing. You're bobbing and weaving. Y'all moving together, landing punches. Y'all ripping from the same range. And then you throw something lazy just once. And boom, hook over the top. Now you're weebly wobbly. Now you got to try to get yourself back together against the ropes. That's boxing. And she came across and, and it, it came across beautifully. It, 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 I'm glad it aired on TV. Her plight has been very... She's had a very specific plight with boxing and being not shown to the world. But Heather Hardy, the world is watching now. Just keep doing what you do and you'll be all right. 
Uh, but the thing I want to comment on was they asked her, of course, because she's a boxer and MMA and all these things are connected right now because of the Connor Floyd shit, because all that shit's connected. You have to ask these questions, right? So they ask her about it. They ask her, oh, what's, you know, how does it feel coming across the MMA? Is it like truly different? And she's like, it's different. It's a different sport. She basically said in a nutshell, it's different because the range is different. She didn't say it exactly like this, but she said it's different. When you throw a jab in boxing, this is her exact reference. When you throw a jab in boxing, you can really get behind it. You can really put some emphasis on it. But when you throw that same jab in MMA, you're open to the leg kick. You're open to the takedown. So it's different. So basically her narrative is that it's more difficult to box in MMA than it is to box in boxing. She said they're different. But by the context of what she said, it would lead you to believe that it's more difficult to box in MMA than it is to box in boxing. The the things that MMA risk that they bring in aren't there. But it's also it's also a double edged sword because MMA fighters aren't used to jabs being thrown at them full committal at full speed. So it's kind of it's a paradox what she said. Right. Like in terms of boxing in MMA, you can't jab like you want to because the leg kick or takedowns there. So you kind of have to tailor your jab around the fact that you could get sweeped off your feet or you could get hit with a kick. But in boxing, you can get behind the jab. So there's confidence in the jabbing side. But on the flip side, that jab is more critical now because it's more powerful. It's more impactful. It has more of a stamp. So it's kind of one of those things, the double edged sword. So. It's one of those things to look out for in the Conor Floyd fight. If you're looking out for anything, the difference, look at the Nate Diaz fight. Look at Nate Diaz flopping out that non-committal jab. And then look at when he did stamp down like a boxer and throw that jab. When he stamped down like a boxer and threw the jab, he got countered with a straight left every time and hurt several times. So that's something to look out for. Boxers do commit to the jab, and the jab is what leads them to getting hit by the counter left from Conor. So something to look forward to. Or... On the flip side, Floyd may be able to land jabs all night that just completely stop Floyd Connor's forward progression because he is stepping into the jab, popping it with good timing, popping it with good speed, putting power behind it. So that's that's a good point to look at. It's a good point that she made, but like I said, the narrative hurt the narrative that she swung, it sounds more like MMA boxing is less uh it's it's more complicated to box in MMA than it is in it uh, to to boxing boxing and i can say from a, my own personal standpoint sparring training with boxers pro boxers pro mma fighters it's harder for me to box pro mma fighters because when i'm boxing them they're kicking they're they're moving away more often than not and i'm moving forward to box and pressure and they're kicking and my only ways of being successful is to cut down that space limit the uh, space for the kicks to pop limit the space check a couple low kicks and land shots from boxing range and that's how i fight when i'm training with when i spar on the mats it's open spar some people are doing kickboxing some people are doing mma some people are boxing when i box the boxers all the threat of the the kick is gone all the threat of the kick is gone and my boxing can just really show through when i'm boxing mma fighters i gotta worry about the kick and then once i cut off the cut off the angle for the kick once i cut off the distance for the kick i can box and then as soon as they get space again i have to go through the whole process so it is more complicated to box in mma so when you see connor walk out there land a jab jab straight and drop someone or jab jab rear hook like he did uh dustin poirier or or he slips a straight and lands a straight uppercut straight it's more impressive than you think People don't just land in boxing. I mean, in MMA, people don't just land. They fight from such a long range. Everything is looping. Everything is wild. Everything is wide because the range and the context is different. The takedown is there. The the kicks are there. So you have to do everything either all in or all out in MMA. And Connor doesn't. He does it kind of like boxing. Gets in the range, lands shots that he's confident are going to land. That's boxing. And that's 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 punching. And that's what he's bringing over in that mix mix bag fight you know that's what he's bringing over he's bringing over the ability to land and connect mma fighters don't always land sometimes they wing uppercuts out in the open and hit nothing that happens more often than not they wing straight punches and overhands from distances that will never land because the range is different the range ain't that different for connor you might want to watch the chad mendez fight if you think the range is different connor landing shots exactly from where he wanted Chad, 
throwing them from wherever, just hoping to get the distance in, hoping to close the distance and to close the gap in order to land him, not knowing if he's going to close the gap, not having a, an assurance that, that he's going to land. On the other side, Connor knew when he was going to land. He knew what was going to land, and that's what leads to him being as successful as he is in MMA. But back to Bellator NYC, the main question that, the main thing that media members were talking about is if you paid $50, which most people did, it's a pay-per-view, so you kind of had to if you wanted to see it. If you paid $50, were those six fights on the main card worth the $50? Hell the fuck no. Let's not even pretend that that was high quality MMA. It was hilarious. So it was about as funny as a Three Stooges episode. So if you can marry paying fifty dollars for Three Stooges, you know you spent your money well. But like I said, it's been Apex Gamer. Until next time, I'll catch you guys on the flip side. Bellator NYC, not good. Hold the hold the phone, not good. Better luck next time. I'm out.